Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's tuning in. On behalf of Pio Petro, Arab Oil and Gas Academy, and SPE Egypt section, I would like to welcome you to today's session. My name is Shahed Behajet. I'm a third year petroleum engineering student at KNU in Kurdistan, Iraq, and I will be your moderator for today. Before we start, I'd like to remind you to please drop any question you have regarding the webinar in the comments section below, and please submit your quizzes before the deadline. Now, without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Rehab Al-Maghrabi, who will be giving her webinar on raw material for petrochemical industry. Dr. Rehab is currently the head of the Petroleum Refinery and Petrochemical Engineering Department at Faculty of Petroleum and Mining Engineering at Suez University. Also, she's an adjunct, adjunct faculty at IUC Chemistry Department. She holds a PhD degree in Petroleum Engineering from Imperial College London, UK in 2013. Dr. Rehab al Maghrabi is among the first Egyptian women to receive a PhD in Petroleum Engineering, if not the first. She holds an MSc and BSc in Chemical Engineering from Suez Canal University. Dr. Rehab is the PI of an Enhanced Oil Recovery Lab at Faculty of Petroleum and Mining Engineering at Suez University. She published her research work in many international journals and conferences. She is currently supervising many MSc and PhD students on research topics such as EOR, CO2 capture and separation and corrosion inhibition. In February 2018, she received the prestigious Professional Achievement Award from the British Embassy as a recognition of her achievement in Egypt as UK alumni. Dr. Rehab is interested in advancing the teaching standard as she is an ABET program evaluator. Dr. Rehab, thank you so much for coming, and the mic is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, dear student, we are now going to talk about uh, raw materials for petrochemical industries. Um, uh, we will talk about natural ga uh, gas and other gases, and also other sources, not only other gas sources. So, um, uh, so let's uh, start. So first, um, the main feedstock for any petrochemical um, industry will be natural gas and crude oil. But actually, this is not the only sources. There is other feedstock or sources uh, for uh, the petrochemical industry. For example, for the gas sources, if we are talking about gases, we can find natural gas, which is a normal thing that we know. We have refinery gas, we have shell uh, gas, we have gas hydrates, cool with methane and cool actually, biogas and geopressurized gas. In this uh, lecture, we will talk uh, briefly about each one of these gas, how we produce these gases, uh, and we will focus mainly up, uh, on natural gas production and the cleaning of this natural gas. Also, there is um, other sources from oil, which is the, the, um, the most the known crude oil. <clears throat> other sources like oil shale, and shell oil, light oil, tar sand, and cool again. Okay. So um, also we will talk briefly about each uh, one of these sources and um, uh, what is the composition of these sources. Uh, why we would uh, like to know the different sources of the petrochemical? Because actually um, we want the building block. We want to reach to the building block or produce the building block for the petrochemical industry. The building block for any petrochemical industry, as we will see here in this graph, is methane, ethylene, propylene, butane, butylene, butadiene, and PTX, which is aromatic phase, benzene, toluene, and xylene. So this is the building block from which the other um, intermediate or the other final product of the petrochemical industry uh, will be produced, like the polyethylene terephthalate, polyvinyl, um, uh, alcohol and uh, and uh, and um, the other uh, any other polymers or any other film, um, in the product will be based on one of this building block. Okay, as you can see here in this tutor. I, actually, I like this poster. Okay, so um, uh, to, uh, the starting point to produce any of this building block will be either crude oil, natural gas, and coal, which is the main the main known sources, but there is other sources also we will talk about in, in this lecture. So let's start first with the natural gas. So this is, will be uh, just to, to know, this is uh, will be the main focus. 
uh, like we will be talking about natural gas for 30 minutes or also how to produce this natural gas, how to clean this natural, not produce, how to clean this natural gas and reach to um, uh, the, the purity that is required uh, for the petrochemical industry. So actually natural gas it has two types, the associated gas and non-associated gas. So associated gas in the reservoir, you know that uh, it can natural gas can be um, uh, co-produced with crude oil. So the reservoir can be uh, contain can contain crude oil and and uh, natural gas, and also there there ca there can be uh, some reservoir with only natural gas um, alone, which is the non-associated natural gas type. Natural gas is not only the main component in the natural gas is the methane, but there is other uh, gas is coming out of the, uh, with the natural gas with the methane, like the ethane, propane, butane, uh, up to C C7. We can say that up to um, C7 will be uh, heptane. Okay, so uh, if this is not, uh, um, not uh, not associated. Okay, so if we look at uh, the natural gas, of course, the composition of the natural gas differentiates with the change in the field. So not every field uh, has the same composition of natural gas. There is different composition according to the field that is produced. Okay, so as you can see, and also if this is non-associated gas, there is different, uh, it is different than if it is associated gas. So for example, as you can see here in this table, um, uh, we have non-associated gas type and associated gas type. Actually, the most known is the, uh, the non-associated gas type uh, are mainly methane. So the composition of methane is higher in the non-associated gas type. So this is gener general rule. Okay, so for if we see, uh, look at uh, the non-associated gas, we will have methane here, the composition, which is 95%, and then we have ethane, we have propane, okay? We have other non-hydrocarbon components like the uh, carbon dioxide, we have nitrogen, it is different than the other type of natural non-acetic gas from different field. Okay, so this was Salt Lake, and this is from Cliffside, USA. So this is different composition. Um, from so, for example, in this, there is, there is no butane in the Salt Lake, uh, USA field. There is no butane or uh, pentane uh, and C five plus. When, we, when I say C five plus, it means pentane and the heavier components. Okay. Just to, to, uh, to know, there is no olefins. Natural gas coming out of the reservoir contain no olefin. Also, the crude oil coming out from the reservoir contain no olefin. It's paraffin. For the crude oil, it is paraffin, aromatics, and naphthenes only. There is uh, maybe some isoparfins, but um, no olefins are found in the crude oil, or no, and no olefins are found in the, um, in the natural gas coming out of the reservoir. And petrochemical industry actually is based on olefin. And aromatics okay so for the uh, for the associated gas we will find that the, the percent of methane is lower uh, 62 percent and higher heavier components higher percent of heavier components such as ethane propane butane and the pentane plus also you can find uh, carbon dioxide hydrogen sulfide so in, as a general rule so the the, natu the composition of natural gas is not constant it is different from one field to another and also it's different uh, if it is associated gas associated with the production of crude oil so you will expect to have high, heavier molecular high molecular weight component and if it is non associated gas so it's only natural gas present it will have uh, a, a higher a lighter component, higher composition of uh, the composition of lighter components will be higher, such, such as methane. Um, uh, there is also other hydrocarbon, non hydrocarbon components, just, uh, like H2S, you know, the hydrogen sulfide, and carbon dioxide. We have nitrogen, helium, sometimes we have mercury, which is not welcomed at all in the natural gas, and all heavier, uh, as I told you, heavier components. So actually, the natural gas has to be uh, to meet certain standards uh, to be bombed uh, uh, for, because if you want to bomb this natural gas, it has to be cleaned. You don't want your pipeline to be damaged due to uh, corrosion and uh, pitting, hydrates, and uh, so you don't want this uh, hydrocarbon to damage um, your pipelines and also non-hydrocarbon component to damage your pipeline due to corrosion and pitting. 
Also for the uh, uh, calorific value, you want to, uh, to, to adjust the natural gas to be only mainly methane because the calorific value, uh, the nitrogen and carbon dioxide uh, have no calorific value, is zero calorific value. So, um, so for the natural gas cleaning option, we, ha we have first to uh, once you produce your natural gas, you have to separate it from water, so do, uh, using gravity. Okay. Then there is uh, acid uh, gas removal, you have uh, dehydration, removal of water, mercury removal and nitrogen rejection, which is nitrogen removal, a natural gas liquid recovery, fractionation and sweetening. We will go uh, uh, like in fast way, um, uh, step by step uh, um, in the process of natural gas cleaning. So the first thing is to uh, remove the water. So once you, if, you, if the gas is associated gas, so you have oil, water, and gases. So this is a three-phase separator. You separate the water, you separate uh, oil and the gas from the top. If there is, it is non-associated gas, so it will, there will be no oil, and this will be two-phase separator on the water and gas from the top. The next step after you, uh, you remove or, uh, the water from the natural gas using the gravity, the difference in the gravity is to uh, remove acid gas. In general, acid gas, what we mean by acid gas, it's H2S and carbon dioxide. And in this case, we call this gas sour gas. So the natural gas will, in the case, if, if it has acid gas, it will be called sour gas. Once you remove this acid gas, the natural gas will be sweet gas. So actually, why do you want to separate the H2S? Actually, because H2S mainly causes corrosion. So acid gas will react to it, will cause a, a degradation of your pipeline, and you don't want to, to damage your pipeline. So this is the main reason to, you don't want also H2S contains sulfur. This sulfur will cause them. Uh, so if, you have, if the natural gas um, enters the refinery plant or it, uh, the petrochemical uh, plant, containing H2S, it will damage your catalyst, okay? So you don't want to have H2S in your natural gas, okay? Sulfur also react with, uh, with um, if you burn uh, this natural gas containing H2S, it will, you will get uh, SO2. So SO2, SO2, the emission of SO2 will give you uh, acid rains, okay? So this is one also, also of the reason why you want to uh, remove H2S. CO2 also is not, it's not welcomed at all in the natural gas. So why do you want, uh, why do you guess we want to remove this CO2 from the natural gas? So actually CO2 also will cause corrosion. CO2 has zero calorific value. So you are, you are um, yeah, so it has no cost. It will uh, actually, it will reduce the selling price of your natural gas because the, sell, the selling price of your natural gas depends on the calorific uh, value of this natural gas. Um, also, CO2 causes corrosion. So, CO2 will react with water, okay, and uh, and will cause corrosion to your pipelines and for refinery and petrochemical plant equipment. So, how this acid gas is removed? So, there is three uh, known process that can be used to remove this acid gas: uh, physical absorption, physical adsorption and chemical absorption, okay? So actually absorption is a, where you, uh, the, the gas is dissolved inside the, uh, the liquid that you have, or the solvent that you have. Physical adsorption, so it's, in this case, it will be just in the top, so you are using solid uh, material, and the gas will be on the top, okay? And we'll see how. So for acid gas treatment, in this case, there is no chemical reaction, physical absorption, physical absorption. There is no chemical reaction. Okay? And we have, uh, for, uh, in this case, the solvent will be dimethyl ether of polyethylene glycol. This is one of the, of the process or the solvent that is used as a physical absorption. No chemical reaction occurs between the acid gas and the solvent. So if you go in uh, like um, in a first way to illustrate this uh, flow sheet, actually, if you are say if you are using solvent, you have two um, at least two uh, two towers. One is for the absorber, 
okay? The other for regeneration. You want to regenerate this solvent. So the absorber tower and the regeneration tower. And in between, there is other serving facilities. So, uh, so if you have your sour gas introduced from the bottom of this, of this tower, so this tower is the absorber, okay? Where the solvent extracts all the sour gases from the natural gas. So you are injecting sour gas, you are getting from the top sweet gas without H2S, without CO2. From the top here, of course, if you are cleaning your sour gas, you are, uh, of course, using solvent here if, if it is physical absorption. So you are using solvent, the solvent is introduced from the top and is flowing in contact with the sour gas introduced. So it's the sour gas will be cleaned and the solvent will be, in this case, rich solvent containing H2S and other um, uh, and H2S and CO2, okay? The gas, to be short, the, the, the rich solvent will be introduced to the regeneration tower. In this case, the regeneration would be heating the solvent. So once you heat, you can heat the solvent uh, or introduce air, okay? From, or gas to heat the solvent or to separate the, the unwanted gases from the solvent. So you introduce the rich solvent to the regeneration tower and you get from, uh, the, from the top is the off gases, which is H2S and CO2 gases and air or other gases injected. And from the bottom is the lean solvent, which means that the solvent contain no acid gases in. So the, here from the bottom is the rich solvent and this is um, cooled and then injected to rarefy, uh, to again to the absorber for another cycle. Okay. So this is the main concept in any solvent extraction. If I'm saying physical absorption, chemical absorption, whatever the absorption or the weight or you, are, uh, you are using, or whatever the solvent you are using, you have two towers, absorber and regeneration. And of course, to do regeneration, you have to heat this uh, solvent to separate, or if there is a bond between, if there is a chemical bond, in this case, there is no chemical bond. But for chemical absorption, you have to break the bond between the solvent and uh, the acid gas, and you have to heat this before regeneration. So physical, in the case, for physical absorption, in this case, we are using a molecular sieve or zeolite. So it is, um, uh, uh, or maybe activated carbon. So it is porous material, contain pores inside. You can, uh, yeah. so this is the, uh, in the photo here is the molecular sieve. Okay. So here in the circle here, this is a molecular sieve. It contain pores inside, okay. The pores have a throat. It's like it's like any any uh, rock in the so it actually the light there is natural material so the light uh, sometimes there is a synthetic the light and the, uh, and actually the light also can be natural material okay depending on the type of the light so uh, so the molecular sieve here or the light contain pores these pores have a certain throat okay so this throat allow the um, a molecule of certain size only to pass through and the other molecules are bigger than the size of this rod so it cannot enter this pore so as, as you pass as the gas passes, passes through you have gas and this gas contain h2s and co2 h2s and co2 is a smaller size molecule compared to methane so co2 and h2s will go inside this pores and the methane will not be able to go inside and will pass without being captured with this molecular sieve. You introduce hot air so as to, to remove after for the regeneration because you want to do to get um, to get the CO2 and H2S um, outside. After a certain time, you, there will no be uh, there will be no um, capturing because the pores are filled in um, filled with H2S and CO2, no other spaces. Uh, are free for for capturing H2S and CO2. So you have to stop the process and do a generation, regeneration cycle. The regeneration cycle has to, um, using hot air you um, uh, or steam, you heat up this uh, molecular sieve and then uh, the air will replace the place of the CO2 and H2S. So um, the third process is the chemical absorption. Okay, in this case, it, um, and this is the normal used case actually. It's used in many in many uh, gas um, uh, uh, gas reservoirs 
or uh, for surface facilities uh, for natural gas. So, uh, so in this case, you have to remove CO2 and H2S using solvent. This solvent is amine-based, amine-based on like uh, monoethanolamine, diethanolamine, uh, diisopropanolamine, diglycolamine. Okay, so it is not, uh, actually based on amine, amine solution. So this amine solution go um, undergo chemical reaction. So as you can see here, so the amine here uh, react with H2S and, so, and form sulfide and for the CO2, it form carbonates. So uh, this bond is easy to break. So it is uh, for the choice of your solvent, it has to be uh, used, um, uh, 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 so it can uh, carry on reaction with the CO2 and H2S, but this bond or this reaction or, uh, or the bond between the sulfur and the amine is, uh, could be easy break. So as we can regenerate the solvent again and use it again, we don't, uh, we don't want to waste your solvent because if the reaction is permanent, as we, can, uh, as we will see in the NaOH, so if you are using caustic, caustic soda, in the AOH, the reaction will be permanent. So you are, you have to use each time fresh solvent. Okay? So this is, will not be economic. So when you choose your solvent, you have to choose a solvent that can be easily regenerated and used back uh, again in the process. So, um, so this is uh, the process of uh, chemical absorption. As I told you, there, is, there will be two towers, the yellow tower um, here, or the orange tower here. We have absorber and regeneration, okay? So for the absorber here, we have the, the, the acid gas fit uh, from the bottom of the tower. So normally the gas is fit from the bottom because it will naturally, um, according to the different in the gravity, it will na uh, naturally go outside, um, uh, raised to the top of the tower and the solvent is introduced from the top. So the lean solvent, which is mean solvent without any acid gas contained in, okay? So or acid gas free solvent will be introduced from the top. So uh, this, uh, this, um, this solvent will flow naturally because it is liquid, will flow naturally to the, to the bottom of the, the absorber tower and we get from the bottom rich solvent. So the solvent will extract any um, acid gas from this sour gas and we have sour gas produced from the top and the rich solvent containing H2S Produced from the bottom, because we want this process to be economic, and we don't. We don't uh, every time we don't have to use a fresh solvent, so we have to go and uh, um, uh, like conduct regeneration of the solvent. So how we we will uh, regenerate the solvent? So we will heat up the solvent, and also introduce steam to this uh, to the tower, or also for heating. At the end, you will uh, so you will break the bond. You will have acid gas coming out from the top, and the fresh solvent coming uh, uh, coming. So it is here from the repoiler, so coming back as a fresh solvent introduced back to the absorber. Okay. So this is a chemical absorption. There are other solvent as uh, um, else than amine, like uh, the alkali carbonates, like as I, um, uh, for potassium carbonate, for example. Also, it can can react with CO2 and H2S, and um, you can find this solvent uh, in ammonia production plants because you want to uh, to remove CO2 from the sand gas or from uh, from hydrogen. So you uh, in most ammonia plants or in some uh, many ammonia plants, you use uh, potassium carbonates to uh, remove CO2. Uh, uh, caustic. Um, Soda or uh, NaOH also react with CO2 and H2S could be used, but it is a permanent reaction. Um, and the uh, carbonate and sulfide of the of the so sodium is permanent, non-reversible, uh, so it is not easy regenerated. So you are wasting the NaOH, and it is not recommended to use. So now we have uh, an, our natural gas free from acid gas. Uh, the next step is to uh, conduct dehydration, which means that the dehydration we have to remove the water from your natural gas. Okay, so why how so why we would like to remove the water from natural gas? Didn't we have just to remove it here? 
No, because this water is um, is just only we use the gravity, gravitational force, um, uh, to separate the, uh, the water from gas. So um, in this case, we want to um, reach a part per million concentration of water, which is not achievable by this um, a way of separation. So we uh, conduct dehydration. The dehydration or, um, is water actually, um, if we are uh, pumping uh, our natural gas, and this gas, natural gas contain water under high pressure, and uh, in the presence of water, we will form a gas hydrate. As you can see here, this is the gas hydrate as an example of what, have, uh, what can have, um, what is the shape of the gas hydrate. This gas hydrate can cause pitting corrosion because it um, is like um, ice balls. So it will cause uh, uh, pitting in your pipeline and it is not, uh, and also will cause corrosion. Um, the normal corrosion, erosion and the pitting corrosion uh, in your pipeline and also you don't want to, this to happen in your pipeline. So we have absorption and absorption process. So for the absorption, absorption, so you are using chemical absorption, chemical reaction, you are using solvent. In this case, the solvent will be uh, some glycol, ethylene glycol, diethylene glycol, triethylene glycol. So it is in the glycol family. Okay. Uh, so this glycol would like uh, has high affinity to water. It will extract water or capture water from the natural gas, um, and then it is separated using the different pointing point between the glycol and water. Sometimes the water boils at 100 degrees, and glycol boils at 104. So there is a difference in the boiling range between glycol and water. So uh, for this um, a flow sheet, so this is a flow sheet of uh, extraction of uh, water from the natural gas using uh, glycol. So again, for the solvent extraction, so we have two towers, absorption tower and regeneration tower. So the absorption tower, where the wet gas, in this case, so wet gas contain water. So the wet gas introduced from the bottom and then after uh, meeting, uh, meeting with the uh, glycol, it, the glycol will extract the water from this natural gas and we have dry gas. The introduced glycol will be lean in this in the top and then it, after extraction of water it will be rich glycol, then introduced to uh, the regeneration tower. It is heated because we said that it is a difference, we are using the different boiling point between the glycol and water. So because the water boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius, so you would expect the water to be coming from the top, okay? Water vapor from the top and the glycol will be liquid coming from the bottom. And then the glycol will be, uh, uh, the fresh glycol or the lean glycol will be introduced back for another cycle of absorption. Okay, sometimes you inject methanol in the in the gas pipeline if, um, to reduce uh, the hydrate, to lower the hydrate formation temperature. Okay. For absorption, in this case, we are uh, adsorption. Adsorption, we are using solid molecular sieve. Um, the molecular sieve, how, uh, uh, the, the molecule of water is enough to fit inside the pores of this molecular sieve, like here in this case. So. The molecular sieve contain pores, so we have. If we have, if we see the size of the methane is larger size, Na2O2 smaller size, H2O smaller size, so H2O can can go inside uh, the 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 throat of uh, the molecular sieve and being captured inside with the CO2 also and the H2 uh, H2S, and the methane cannot go inside the molecular sieve and it will um, uh, go. Uh, from uh, from the top of the tower or in from the bottom of the tower, whatever is the way you are injecting the gas. So back again here. So this is the flow sheet of uh, of uh, adsorption of um, using molecular sieve. So we can extract water from the gas. So you will can you can see here that there is um, uh, two uh, two uh, two towers extraction towers. Uh, they work alternatively. So once one is uh, filled with H2, uh, H2O or water, uh, so this will be closed and the, the other one will be used. So one in the regeneration uh, phase, the other are in the absorption phase. 
Okay, so let's uh, follow the blue line here. So we have the wet gas uh, introduced to molecular sieve. Okay, so H2, it is introduced from the top in this case. Um, the H2S are uh, captured inside the molecular sieve and the dry gas are coming uh, from uh, uh, the bottom. So what, uh, what, uh, uh, so after it is filled and H2, no more H2O can go inside the molecular sieve. The molecular sieve pores are filled with water. It will be closed and uh, will, uh, will, will um, uh, uh, like store the regeneration step. In this case, it is the red line. So let's see, uh, we will, we take some dry gas here. It is heated, okay. then introduced to uh, the, uh, the molecular sieve uh, or the absorb the absorption tower and it will come water and uh, dry gas from the top. So you have to separate the water in this tower and the dry gas is compressed and uh, maybe the, I'm sorry, it will be injected again with the, with the wet gas, okay? So the other step here after we separate the gas from the water, after we separate the acid gas removal, after dehydration, we cleaned out, we dried our gas, we have to remove the mercury if the concentration of mercury is high. We can do mercury uh, removal using molecular sieve or activated carbon. So it is to actually mercury cause corrosion to the, uh, the praised aluminum heat exchanger, which is not uh, actually can cause um, uh, environmental and safety hazard. Um, it's not allowed. Mercury also cause catalyst poisoning. Uh, so mercury is not, um, is not welcomed as a material in or uh, uh, a component in the natural gas. Two steps can be used to remove the mercury, the non-regenerative mercury sorbent or the, re uh, the regenerative mercury absorption. So the non-regenerative, well, you expect that it will be damaged. So you cannot, uh, you are using material that will be uh, damaged. No, it cannot be regenerated again. Okay. So the, the regenerative uh, mercury, you use molecular sieve, which can be uh, regenerated back using uh, hot gas. Okay, so this is, I will not go in more detail using mercury for mercury uh, removal, but you have to know that the mercury is, uh, can be removed using two, uh, two methods, non-regenerative mercury sorbent. The sorbent will, not, will be damaged forever. The surface of the, of the sorbent cannot be regenerated back, cannot be used again. Like um, the permanent reaction of NaOH with, um, uh, if I, uh, I cannot compare, but uh, yeah, if you, can, you can imagine that. So the NOH uh, co uh, conduct permanent reaction with H2S and CO2. So you have to, fr to use fresh uh, uh, solvent every time. In this case, also you have to use fresh solvent every time. It is it's costly. For the regenerative mercury absorption, in this case, you have uh, you can um, uh, regenerate this back again. Uh, for the next step here, after we remove the mercury. We have to clean this natural gas. Uh, this uh, 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 from the nitrogen. If you contain nitrogen, nitrogen actually um, uh, uh, has zero calorific value. Again, it will reduce the calorific value of uh, of um, if uh, if you have a huge amount of nitrogen or the composition of nitrogen in your natural in your natural gas is high, you, uh, it will reduce the calorific value of your methane or your natural gas. So it will affect the selling price of this natural gas. Also natural gas, if you, the nitrogen, if it's contained in the natural gas, at the end you, uh, you can um, have NOx, which is actually uh, not environmental friendly and cause, uh, um, affect the ozone layer. So if we have to separate nitrogen. Nitrogen can be separated using two way cryogenic process and a pressure swing absorption. Cryogenic process actually is using the difference in the boiling point between the methane and nitrogen. So if you see here, so we have methane, uh, the boiling point is uh, uh, minus 161. In the nitrogen, it is minus 195. So using, at a, um, using very, uh, very low temperature and using high pressure, we will find that the, the, uh, or the methane will be liquefied and the nitrogen will be in the gas phase. So you can separate the nitrogen 
from the methane using cryogenic process, okay, cryogenic separation. In the pressure swing absorption, it's like the molecular sieve one, you have, uh, you will end up having nitrogen, so the molecular sieve will, uh, will have nitrogen inside, captured inside the pores of this molecular sieve, and the methane is not captured, okay. So uh, according to this, the methane can be separated or the nitrogen can be separated from methane. This is about nitrogen removal. So okay, again, the process that you are going, uh, uh, maybe if you're a natural gas that you have, do doesn't have nitrogen inside, so you don't have to do the nitrogen removal step, okay? So the steps that is used um, uh, over the, the natural gas uh, cleaning uh, options are according to the composition of the natural gas. If the natural gas contains no mercury, so you don't have to remove mercury or, or use this, pro this step, okay? The, last, uh, the, 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 other, the next step is to separate the methane from the other natural gas liquid, okay? So methane is what, when we say natural gas, so the normal um, uh, natural gas in, in our, uh, in the stock, used in the stock or in, uh, for um, uh, maybe uh, for your cooking or your, in the, in the, fur, uh, in the furnace, in the industry, when you say natural gas, you mean methane. So you have to separate the methane from the other gases. It is important, the other gases is important for the petrochemical industry. So ethane, propane, butane, butane is important for, um, uh, has gases for the petrochemical industry. So you have to separate methane. Actually, methane itself is important also for the petrochemical industry. You, you From methane, it can be converted to sangat and for, to methanol and formaldehyde and, uh, and so on. So for the bit, uh, you have in this step, you have to separate. The, uh, it's called the methanizer. So you have to separate the methane from the natural gas liquid. So how, how we can uh, separate this methane from the natural gas liquid using the absorption method or the cryogenic expand, expander process. So this is the, the, the step how we uh, so use cryogenic separation. Uh, so what what you have if you ex if you have a pre uh, gas under pressure and then you allow this pressure to ex uh, this gas to expand without uh, losing heat to the surrounding. Okay, this is called um, uh, uh, cryogenic expansion. Okay, what you you will end up that the temperature of this gas will be reduced. This, this principle are used in this, um, or it's called adiabatic, adiabatic um, expansion, okay? We use this process to, um, uh, to reduce the temperature of the natural gas. Once you reduce the temperature of the natural gas, the natural gas liquid will be in the liquid state and the, uh, and the methane will be in the gas phase. So we can separate, uh, separate them from each other. Uh, so um, here is the, at the back of the expansion, what I told here, is a thermal iso um, isolation wall. So this is a wall. The gas is under pressure. Once you allow this gas to expand without, in, uh, without losing um, temperature to the surrounding, the gas um, will uh, go cryogenic cooling. So this will allow us to reach very, very low temperature, so like minus 150 or minus 180 in this case the ethane propane will be in the liquid, cooled in the liquid uh, state, and the methane will be in the gas state. Of course, we don't want to uh, to have water in this case. If you have water with the natural gas, it will form hydrates. We don't want uh, this hydrate in, uh, in this process. <clears throat> so for this, uh, the flow sheet uh, illustrates the cryogenic expansion. So you have uh, your gases here, um, uh, uh, it is the first step of cooling, heat exchanger. So you cool this gas uh, using a heat exchanger. So it's not very, uh, uh, so not a cryogenic uh, cooling because it is very um, cryogenic cooling, uh, cooling will be in the minus region. Um, so the first step is to cool this natural gas. Then uh, using, uh, because of this cooling down, um, you, uh, the natural gas is introduced to a tower. If there is liquid, um, uh, maybe C5, uh, plus will be condensated and as a, uh, from the natural gas or separated out as a liquid from the natural gas and is separated from the bottom and then the gas will go uh, to the top from will be um, produced from the top of the tower then it will enter expander 
uh, using Jules uh, Thompson valve. So the gas is under under pressure and then it's allowed to expand. Once it's expanded, so it will lose uh, the temperature. Once it is, it will use this losing in temperature or this reduction in temperature will, uh, um, will give us uh, uh, to the minus uh, region, cryogenic region, and then the separator, this gas into a separator will be the liquid. Here in this case, the liquid will be ethan, propane, and butane, and the, from the top will be methane. Okay, and maybe some, some uh, natural gas liquid with the methane. We expect from this process to have a purity uh, from 90 to 95 um, uh, person. The other process is the absorption method. In this absorption method, we use oil. Okay, the oil will be uh, will have a high affinity to natural gas liquid, and then it is it will be separated to natural gas liquid. So let's see what's happening here in the flow sheet. So we have the uh, the gas, rich gas containing methane and natural gas liquid introduced to the tower. From the top here, um, we have oil. The oil is better to be co uh, cooled. So in um, uh, at not a high temperature, a low temperature, very low temperature. The oil is introduced in this tower So um, and extract uh, the natural gas liquids from the methane and uh, it will be rich oil. The rich oil enter a tower will be the propane is separated from the rest of um, the liquid, uh, natural gas liquid. And then another tower with the C5 and natural gas liquid also are separated from the oil. Mm -hmm. The oil are um, uh, uh, pumped back to the regenerate, uh, to the absorption tower. So it is, uh, can uh, go another cycle. From the top of the absorption tower, we have the natural gas, which is mainly methane with a slightly small amount of natural gas liquid. Also a process uh, membrane separation. You can also separate um, uh, methane from the natural gas liquid using membrane. This membrane separation technology can also be used, um, uh, it is used actually in Egypt to separate the acid gas such as CO2 from, uh, from the natural gas. And uh, I didn't discuss it in the, in the acid gas separation, but it's actually me me membrane separation is one of the methods that can be used to remove acid gas and also can be used to remove methane from the natural gas liquid. After you separate the methane from the natural gas liquid, you compress this methane and transport it uh, to um, uh, globally. So it has to be uh, liquefied, okay? Liquefied natural gas, LNG. So it is methane compressed and cooled at, at very to low, very low temperature and at high pressure and transported using um, uh, trucks and uh, and ships especially equipped for natural, nat uh, liquefied natural gas transportation. And, uh, okay, so you now you have separated, we separated the methane, we have natural gas liquid together, which is ethane, propane, butane, C4, okay, and C10. We have to separate this from each other. It is not, um, uh, each one of these is va are variable for the petrochemical industry, but combined, it is not valuable. So you have to separate this fraction or natural gas liquid from each other using fractionation uh, process here. So, uh, um, so the first step, you are, um, so the gas here, according to uh, to the flow, let's say, uh, discuss the flow sheet um, uh, directly, and, the, and this is the discussion of the flow sheet. But actually, the, um, the gas here is introduced, which contain uh, methane, propane, butane, and pentane plus, so it means C5 and higher component, which has, uh, this gas is um, methane free, doesn't contain any methane. So the first, from the first tower, fractionation tower, ethane is, uh, which is called the de-ethanizer. The ethane is separated from the top and the rest of the natural gas are um, introduced to the next fractionation tower. Then, uh, so now the methane, the natural gas uh, or the liqu uh, liquefied natural gas are uh, free from uh, ethane and then introduced to the depropanizer, the propane uh, produced from the top and the other um, components C4 and the C5 plus are uh, produced from the bottom. 
then into, uh, enter another fractionation tower where the butane is separated from uh, C5 plus. Is C5 plus in uh, in most cases are called the natural gasoline. Okay, so C5 plus also is important for the petrochemical industry. So natural gasoline produced from the bottom. For the C4, we have two C4, so the isomer, we don't have isopropane. Okay, <coughs> so the, the first isomer that we have normal pentane and isopentane. So uh, the butane mixture are introduced to butane splitter, splitter so isobutane and normal butane. I, it depends actually about uh, on the, the composition of iso and normal uh, uh, butane if you uh, will uh, use a, uh, a butane um, or butane splitter. The last step for the natural gas cleaning is the sweetening. Okay. You have to clean your natural gas from mercaptan. Okay. Actually, you will uh, we use in this case ammonia or NaOH. Okay. So uh, uh, ammonia and NaOH will react with mercaptan, which is RSH. Okay. RSH is the mercaptan. Will uh, the caustic solution will react with mercaptan and produce disulfides. The disulfides are insoluble. Okay. Sometimes catalyst is used and um, you can use uh, NaOH or uh, ammonia in the, uh, and it is called the Merox process. Okay. Um, if the mercaptan is a concentration of mercaptan in your natural gas is high, you have to uh, do Merox process or mercaptan removal process. In this case, the, the H2 uh, free phase, which is uh, only contain mercaptan. So the natural gas here is introduced to the first tower, and then um, the, the, uh, the caustic solution is introduced to the top of the tower, uh, which will have solvent extraction. Okay, so and there will be reaction. So the uh, natural uh, NaOH will react with mercaptan and form um, disulfides here. So NaOH uh, with the disulfide. And then from the top is the natural gas free from mercaptan. Okay, and then you introduce some catalyst and air in this process will be regeneration of um, of the uh, uh, of the mercaptan. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, of the caustic solution because uh, you have to separate the disulfide. It is insoluble, so it will precipitate. So if a disulfide is insoluble, and if, uh, the air here will be coming from the top also of the separator and the free caustic solution will be uh, bumped back to the extractor or uh, the absorption tower. Okay. Um, uh, so again, this is a full process of natural gas that is used to clean natural gas. With the, uh, um, so the, the, the different step um, actually, sometimes H2S, in most cases, H2S, if, uh, if a huge amount of H2S is, is, uh, is, um, could be found, so we can use cloud process to transform, uh, transform, transform this H2S to elemental sulfur. And again, elemental sulfur is, can be used in many like battery um, uh, uh, manufacturing and um, electro electrodes and in the petrochemical industry um, for uh, uh, for uh, uh, rubber production and so on. Now we have methane as a product. I can, and then ethane separately, propane separately, but butane separate, and the pentane uh, as a separate process. All these are, so the natural gas are valuable in the petrochemical industry and the intellectual lecture. We will see how, what chemicals can be uh, um, produced from each of these components. Okay. Why these components are variable? Why? How? Uh, what is the petrochemical uh, material based um, or can be produced uh, using this um, uh, building block or using these raw materials? The other gas source is the refinery gas. Actually, we have also the, from the um, uh, crude oil as a as a few, uh, as a source. So we have refinery gas a source for petrochemical. We have crude oil as a source of petrochemical um, uh, based material. Okay. So refinery is, is slightly complicated. It's not a slightly, it is actually complicated. I will not go um, and discuss every process in this refinery, actually, but this is a, a, a schematic overview of a refinery plant uh, where we, at the end, if you look at, at the product that we have, um, we have LPG, which is a gas, propane uh, and butane, which is valuable for the petrochemical industry, actually, 
we have also ethane produced uh, we, uh, and ethylene, propylene produced from the refinery in the crack, catalytic cracking, which is also important for the, pet uh, for the petrochemical industry. We have, um, uh, I'm sorry, NAFTA, okay, or, or um, the gas oil, I'm sorry, gasoline, NAFTA, and all gasoline, or the, uh, if you know, it's commonly, you can know, this, this is a benzene you put in your car, okay? Not the benzene ring, it's, ben it's commonly known in Egypt benzene, okay? So the gasoline actually is an important feedstock for the petrochemical industry because the gasoline is a source for olefins if you are using um, uh, steam cracking. Uh, so yeah, the gasoline can be steam cracked to olefins and uh, benzene to wind xylene, which is an important building block for the petrochemical industry. A gas oil also can be used as a feedstock. So actually the crude oil um, industry or, uh, or refinery industry is an important industry in the petrochemical um, uh, uh, industry. Okay, so are you, so you can here find here uh, the feedstock for the petrochemical according to the distillation. The product here is light and methane, ethane, pro, uh, propane, and the butane, which is all used for the petrochemical industry. Catalytic cracking also produce ethylene, propylene, butylene, which is a building block for the petrochemical industry. Cooking, which is a thermal cracking, produce ethylene, propylene, butylene. It's a byproduct. All this is byproduct. And also for the catalytic cracking, we can produce NAFTA, okay? Uh, for cooking also, NAFTA is produced, which also all of these are important products or open building block for the petrochemical industry. For the natural gas, it can, uh, you can have methane, ethane, propane, and butane, okay? So actually, this is a sum of what is, um, you have in the crude oil industry, uh, petroleum refinery industry, and refinery gas. I, mean, I, I will not go on more details about this process because it will be a very, very long lecture. But uh, we, I will start with, uh, about talking about the other sources else than natural gas and crude oil. Actually, we know that uh, the, the crude oil, um, due to pressure and um, uh, how the crude oil is formed, it is applied to high pressure. Uh, the animals and the, the plants, the, the remaining of the animal plant, are um, uh, have a combo um, like um, uh, it uh, so due to the pressure applied pressure is buried in the uh, on the air in the earth and due to the pressure and the pressure is converted to crude oil this crude oil uh, migrated to the reservoir and it is um, stopped in this uh, uh, stopped in this formation due to the cap rock in this formation this is the conventional oil field if um, uh, on conventional way of production and this is the port where the oil could be uh, could be found in the rock okay but actually there is unconventional oil which means that there is two types also unconventional we can say um, uh, uh, if the the the, oil, the core itself has pores this pores is not connected together so or the crude oil doesn't migrate and form it craving and we will see how this would be produced. So for the oil source, we have oil shell. Okay, the first oil source that can be used for petrochemical industry with potential. It has a potential to be used as a petrochemical uh, in the for the petrochemical industry is the oil shell. So the oil shell in this case it is believed that the oil does not migrate and it is the source rock. And the form of oil is called cryogene or kerogene. Okay. So kerogene is a is a, like uh, it's believed to be the precursor of a crude oil. So uh, as the kerogene, we ha we have this is the type um, the shape of a kerogene. So uh, is the kerogene is applied uh, uh, at high temperature? You have high temperature without uh, without um, uh, the presence of oxygen, it will be converted to crude oil. Okay. So this cryogene is actually in uh, exist in uh, um, oil shell okay so you have to produce this cryogen from the oil shell we have to the ex situ or in situ processing so in the ex situ you have to mine this like here find normal mining or surface mining of this of this uh, crude uh, this cryogen type or so this oil shell and then take this uh, shells and uh, uh, apply 
um, apply pressure and temperature, high temperature for 150 or 500 degrees in the absence of oxygen, and you force this crudine to be converted to crude oil. And then this crude oil are used, uh, uh, are processed with crude, uh, the normal crude oil to uh, for um, for production of fuel or uh, or the other uh, fraction. Okay. The other process is in situ where you have you. Uh, this crugine has to be converted to crude oil. It cannot be produced um, or normally produced as a crugine. Okay, you cannot produce crugine um, just to pump it up. No, you have to convert this crugine in situ. Okay, this is the other method. Um, at, at like uh, the degrees, 345 degrees, 375, uh, 370 degrees Celsius by heating the formation. So to heat this formation, you can use um, uh, like uh, uh, electrode or thermal uh, or electricity, okay? So you bury electrodes and you conduct electricity to heat up the formation and uh, force this creation to be converted to crude oil, okay? Actually, it is believed that this oil shell is, um, uh, the reserves for this oil shell is three trillion pearls. So it is about a, a, a big, uh, huge reserve, okay? But it is, the production is very expensive and it is it's still in the very early process. The other source here is the shell oil. Actually, there is um, a huge development in the shale oil and shale gas in USA. And after it is um, uh, make the, the shale gas, uh, uh, make again a recovery of the USA in the gas market. So you can find that the, uh, if you compare the gases production in the, in the Middle East uh, and USA, you will find the USA a competitor in the natural gas production because of the shell gas and the natural gas production um, and gases itself is an important for the petrochemical industry. So the shell oil is different, it is called tight oil, because it is crude oil, normal crude oil. It is uh, it's, uh, in the, not in the source rock, it is the, the reservoir actually after migration, the kerosene, the kerosene. It is believed that the kerosene is a precursor to crude oil, but it, um, there is some uh, like a debate on this, okay? So if we say that the kerosene is converted in the source rock to crude oil, and this crude oil migrated to the to the reservoir uh, production reservoir, and that this production reservoir, in the case of shell oil, is um, uh, uh, is very very tight pores, not connected pores. As you can see here, it is a very very small pores, not connected together, and it is hard to produce it using normal ways. So what happened is they create hydraulic fracturing of this shell oil or tight oil to produce this tight oil so they pump water at a very high high pressure using uh, uh, maybe um, uh, sometimes it's proven to use uh, material to to increase the viscosity of the water and whatever technique they are using and at high pressure they fracture the shale formation so the oil can naturally flow because they created artificial baths for this oil to produce to prevent this fracture from like um, collapsing again, they use brobent to fill this shale, this cracks. Okay. So this uh, this actually um, uh, okay. harder uh, harder to produce than conven than, unconven uh, than conventional oil um, method, but it is actually uh, easier than the oil shale type, the crushing type. Um, um, it is a, a, a increase in production for uh, this this type of shale oil. It is a normal crude oil. Okay, it's normal crude oil. So actually it can be refined and, uh, and so on. Uh, shale gas also, let's talk about the shale gas. So we, because we talked about shale oil, so it is the same as a shale, shale gas is the same as shale oil, but instead of crude oil is present, there is a gas present. Okay, so actually it is the normal, the, uh, the, the, the normal reservoir, but it is tight, not connected both together so uh, this gas cannot normally flow, else you create fracturing, okay? <clears throat> um, the oil source will continue. We talked about the crude oil, so briefly about crude oil. Oil shell and shell oil, different, we, we talked about the oil shell as a potential source. Um, but it is in the future, uh, shale oil, uh, an actually uh, way of producing uh, oil, actually happening in the USA. Tar sand is mainly in Canada. 
and sometimes in the, uh, some to some extent in the USA. So tar sand actually it is type of crude oil, but it is very very heavy. It, uh, we the crude oil contain uh, gases contain uh, methane, ethane, propane, butane, and and um, uh, like pentane, hexane, heptane, and so on. So uh, the material about uh, about majority of boiling range. But one of this is the bitumen, the very, very heavy, which has a boiling point higher than 350 degrees. The tar sand is mainly bitumen, which have a higher boiling point of 350 degrees Celsius. Okay, so you have uh, yeah, it is very, very, it has a very, low, uh, very high pool, uh, pool point. So in the normal temperature that you have, it will be solid. So. Um, you can to produce this, you have to heat it up to reduce the bore point of this uh, cr uh, this uh, heavy material. Okay, so it can normally flow. So as you can here see here, so the process of um, either uh, in situ or ex situ. So for the in situ process, they inject steam to heat up this formation of tor sand, and then uh, so once this is heated, the bore point of this. Um, torsion is reduced, so it can flow at uh, at ambient condition, 350, 35 degree or 60 degree. It cannot be um, uh, uh, actually without heating, it would be solid. Okay, so once you heat it, it it can flow, so you can produce it, um, uh, uh, and it is used actually in Canada. The other process is to um, uh, mine it or it to um, to mine it and then heat it up uh, uh, elsewhere. As you can see here, so it is um, uh, uh, in the gravity, the, the ABR. Actually, for the crude oil, when we talk about um, uh, how this crude oil is light crude oil or heavy crude oil, we will compare according to the ABR. Okay, so it's a, it's a way of specific gravity conversion between ABR and specific gravity or density. So actually, this between a sixth ABR, which means but a very very heavy um, uh, component, and the bore point is ten degrees Celsius, which means that at 10 degrees Celsius, this epitome will be solid, okay, will not flow. Um, so we, we finished the crude oil sources or fuel sources. Now we will go back to the gas sources. We have gas hydrate. Actually, gas hydrate is a way, um, uh, is a source of methane. You can find this gas hydrate um, uh, found in the, uh, in the, uh, like, uh, the border or the mar margin of continental. So we can hear margin. The margin here we found gas hydrate actually in also in cold uh, um, area like Siberia. So gas hydrate actually is um, a six molecule of water. It's believed that we six molecule of water have a methane um, methane gas molecule caged in it. So you have it is surrounded with methane molecule as you can see here caged with six uh, molecule of water. Um, uh, because this uh, is found at high temperature, high pressure, and very low temperature. Um, it forms hydrate with water, and once you reduce it, uh, the pressure of this reservoir, of this reservoir, it, the water will melt and the methane will be released. Actually, this, uh, this is a big source, a new source of methane from this gas hydrate, but the production actually is not high from uh, from this type. Um, we can say that. Um, So if we compare the composition of, uh, uh, of uh, the gas hydrate cannot be only methane, it can be propane hydrates and uh, pentane hydrates, but it's a normal known is the methane hydrates. Actually, it, con uh, it contains some other um, component. As you can see from this table, we have uh, uh, different, uh, different gas hydrate uh, deposits and we have the composition of each, uh, so methane, ethane, propane, butane, normal butane, uh, uh, isobutane, normal butane, C5 plus CO2 and nitrogen. And we can see there is a difference in the composition according to the place of production of this uh, hydrate. So some hydrate is 99% methane and the other can be as low as 29% of methane and other uh, ethane, propane, and the butane, also, so also some of these have CO2 and nitrogen inside, okay? So uh, the, the other type is the cool bed methane. So, uh, so gas hydrate was a source of methane, which is a methane and ethane and propane, all important gas, gases for uh, uh, or building block for the petrochemical industry. 
كون بيد ميسان فروم ذا نيم ات كونتينز مينلي ميسان اند ويذ سلايت سمول اماونت اوف هاير موليكولر ويت لايك ذا ميسان اند ذا بروبان بيتان تايب بات ات از مينلي ميسان ات كونتين امبيوريتيز ويذ ذا اوكسجين اند سلفر كومباوند ات كونتين ووتر اولسو as well so you can see that this is a cool, cool bit cool bit me sorry i told you this is a way to produce um it's used uh, it's produced actually this robot is produced actually uh, using fracturing and um, and the other technique uh, where you can so you inject um, a horizontal um uh, drilling or the, uh, and then horizontal drilling uh, uh Uh, okay, so it is uh, uh, using horizontal drilling and then you use fracturing okay, to uh, facilitate the production of methane from this coal pit. Uh, the coal itself actually is important um, uh, raw material for the petrochemical industry and for energy production also. For, so actually it's, um, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, of huge reserve um, in North America, in Europe and China. And um, uh, it's expected the, res the reserves of coal is expected to continue after the uh, the running out of crude oil and natural gas. After the crude oil and natural gas are used up, the coal is expected to have to uh, to continue. Okay, so uh, actually the the type of coal there is different type of uh, of coal actually. Um, according to uh, the temperature, uh, it's like cooking. So it is. Um, uh, So this is the early step of cool after cooking, and um, uh, uh, it will it will be co converted to lignite cool, then uh, sub -bitumine, uh, bituminous cool, bituminous cool, and uh, anthracite cool. The different composition here is the different in the uh, the carbon content and the hydrogen content according uh, according to the type of the crude oil. So actually, we have this table. Comparing the crude oil com uh, composition of carbon, hydrogen, sulfur, nitrogen, and oxygen component in the crude oil and the, in the different type of coal. So this is the pit coal, which is the early, the very, it's not valuable. It's, it has a very low heat content um, uh, uh, type of coal. We have, uh, we can see that the, uh, the, the carbon, so the carbon content is very low uh, with high oxygen content, some nitrogen and some sulfur. Okay, um, and hydrogen is not uh, is not um, very high, but it's uh, in the um, in the okay the reasonable region yeah, yeah, actually. So then lignite, which has a higher amount of carbon and a lower amount of oxygen. Okay, then we have the bituminous coal. So this is uh, after aging for a higher for um, and co cooking it for for a longer time. It has a higher Um, uh, actually, a higher uh, heating value, okay, or heat content, and then the the most uh, highest the highest grade of coal is anthracite, which has the highest amount of carbon and the medium amount of hydrogen and small amount of oxygen. Okay, so this is the coal. actually coal is can can be converted to three. Um, uh, Uh, to three uh, 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 phases: gas, liquid, and solid, um, which is called car uh, cool carbonization. Cool carbonization can convert to cool, which is uh, like cooking the cool, heating up the uh, the cool uh, at a very uh, high temperature and with absence of oxygen, okay, or air. Um, this will convert the cool to cook. Cook actually is very important solid material for the iron production and for a battery production or, uh, and so on, okay? The other uh, byproducts that we have using the coal carbonization is gases, which is um, uh, actually mainly methane, but with a very bad smell, right? because you expect to have sulfur in it. Um, uh, coal, a coal tar, which is a liquid type, a very viscous liquid type and can be used in um, shampoo and um, and uh, Uh, like um, anti-dandruff uh, uh, photograph in dyeing, and they, they have a very high, um, uh, many uses. Okay, cool gases is actually methane, as I told you, so it can be used as um, a methane source of all gas, methane gas. Cool gasification, which is one of the important step in the petrochemical industry, and actually it is being used in China 
because China ha uh, doesn't have a high reserve, doesn't actually have any reserve of gases, very, very low reserves of gases, and it has a very huge amount of, uh, of coal um, in, its, um, uh, in, uh, in China. So they are trying to uh, use technologies like, um, uh, uh, like coal to uh, oil and, um, I'm sorry, uh, methane to olefins, MCL, methane, uh, methanol to olefins, and also uh, use coal to olefins, which means converting of coal to sand gas and sand gas to olefin. So this is called the coal gasification. So we have here, um, you can react to uh, 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 carbon co reacting with uh, water, which is called the gasification with the steam. You, uh, you, uh, you will have coal, um, sand gas and hydrogen, okay? Ah, I'm sorry. So you have a carbon monoxide and the hydrogen. We mean by sand gas is a combination of carbon monoxide and the hydrogen. The other way is to use steam or, and the co uh, carbon dioxide to produce uh, hydrogen. So you can use a coal as a source to produce hydrogen also, but it, as actually the composition of hydrogen in, in coal is very, very small, as you can see from the, the figure we showed compared to the amount of hydrogen that can be produced from methane. So for methane C, one C compared to four H. In the coal, it will be like a very, very low amount of hydrogen. So it is not a source of hydrogen. It is a source of sand gas. So it is two CO and the hydrogen. So coal gasification, you can after gasification of coal using different reactions, actually, um, um, you can convert the sand gas to methane. So you can produce methane from the sand gas. You can produce olefins actually from the sand gas using um, as a known um, fissure drop process, and it is used in South um, South Africa and in, in, in different locations. Um, uh, uh, you, if you know the GTL, gas to liquid technology, so the gas to liquid technology is based on same gas for production. So same gas can be produced from methane, can be produced from any fuel, and can be produced from coal. So um, uh, uh, um, gas to liquid technology is also important in the petrochemical industry because you can produce olefin products from this um, this way. Uh, the last two gas sources that we are going to talk about is, uh, is biogas and pressurized gases. So for the biogases here, it's actually the, uh, the biode uh, biodegradation, uh, uh, anaerobic degradation of um, uh, the biodegradable materials, organic component, or the, uh, the sewage um, and the any waste, biological waste, based waste. So the main product in this, uh, uh, as you can see here from here, you can use um, different sources actually to convert this um, waste to biogas. The, bio, the biogas, if you see, is different from one source to another. So source one is waste from domestic home. Uh, um, or source two is the sludge from wastewater treatment. And source three, is agriculture waste. So um, if we see the composition of this uh, biogas, it is mainly methane, as well, then 50 to 60% here, in, from 60 to 75% uh, percent of methane. Uh, it has CO2, it has H2S inside, so okay. So it has CO2, it has nitrogen, it has water, it has H, uh, hydrogen sulfide, and sometimes it has ammonia, okay. Uh, biogas actually is a source of methane, as you can see, it can be used as a uh, as a green natural gas or renewable natural gas. Actually, also methane, it by itself is a way um, is a damaging to our environment because methane is um, the effect of methane or leaking of methane to the atmosphere is in the range of twenty six times the effect of a molecule of CO two. So um, uh, the the effect of methane, one molecule of methane to the atmosphere is 26 times the effect of one mole uh, of one molecule of CO2. So actually um, in the global warming. But in the case for biogas, biogas is a renewable natural gas, which is mainly methane. So they, uh, they uh, pressurize the gases. Um, actually, the, the, the zero thermal um, uh, energy is starting to getting more attention. We have we are saying uh, the, the, the these reservoirs contain uh, three three kilometers to seven point five 
kilometers down inside containing um, uh, um, like a, a very huge um, amount of heat. This, this fluids inside can contain natural gases and other gases dissolve it in this fluid and it can be used as by itself as a gas from the reduction of the gases dissolved in this fluid or can be used for heating uh, or as a heating source or for the generation, generation of steam. It is getting potential attention now. Um, as you, I, I don't know if you see that the miracles are converting, are closing the petroleum engineering uh, speciality and the geo, and I think the geological speciality and converting to more non-conventional sources of, um, of underground mm -hmm. reservoir. One of these is the geothermal uh, reservoirs. Okay, so um, at the end, we can say that there is a vast majority of, uh, of uh, gases that can be um, and, uh, and, and uh, gas sources and uh, oil sources that can be used as a potential for petrochemical industry, uh, which is non-conventional ways on the also the conventional ways can be used for the petrochemical industry and for refinery also. Um, uh, if one of this one uh, of these sources are used up, there is other sources, and I would I don't expect this petrochemical industry to vanish in the very uh, in the in the uh, like in the near future. It will last for a very um, uh, good amount of time. Okay, so thank you. Hope that you uh, enjoyed this lecture, and uh, I hope that I make things simpler for you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Rehab al Maghribi, for a very informative webinar. I'm sure the audience benefited greatly from it. We will be sure to send the audience's questions your way as soon as possible. Thank you, attendees, for tuning in from all around the world. Please stay safe, wear a mask, and have a great day.